it's a pleasure today to introduce our colloquium speaker, Sarah Gibson from the High Altitude Observatory. Sarah did her undergraduate work at Stanford, her graduate work at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She spent a few years at Goddard Space Flight Center and Catholic University before returning to Boulder to the High Altitude Observatory where she is a section head. She has served on a lot of uh, NASA and international committees. She has been a scientific editor for the APJ. She's done work in a variety of things having to do mostly with the solar magnetic field, starting with theoretical models of flux ropes that erupted to form coronal mass ejections, moving more into somewhat more uh, observational work with the observations of coronal cavities formed by those flux ropes. And today, she's, and mo most recently, she's been moving into a tool that you can use to connect theory and observation by making predictions from any theoretical model for what you should observe with the various solar instruments. So today she's going to tell us about how and why magnetism matters. Sarah. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for the invitation to be here. So yes, I hope uh, that I will convince you that magnetism matters, both from the point of view of being a fascinating astrophysical problem to work on, and also from a very down-to-earth uh, sense in that um, space weather has become a reality in our modern technological society. So first, it is a fundamental problem that spans uh, processes from the laboratory to astrophysical plasmas is the process of the storage and explosive release of magnetic energy. And this will be at the heart of what I'm going to talk about. Um, just to give you a little survey here, this uh, shows you a picture of um, one of the most, the process that I'll talk about is a solar flare. And flares can occur on other stars. This is a uh, artist conception of uh, Evie Lacerte, which is a red dwarf. It's about 1% of the luminosity of the sun and about a third of its mass. Uh, but it has stellar flares observed by a Swift X-ray telescope that are thousands of times more powerful than that of the sun, probably because it's a young, fast-rotating star. Um, and another form of storage and release of magnetic energy is here in the, the form of a black hole rotating accretion disk. This is BL Lacerte. And this is, a, a, again, a conception of what, how magnetic fields could twist up and shoot out a jet of material that would explain observations. Up here, this spider configuration is from a laboratory experiment in which a set of flux tubes coalesce, store up energy, and just after this picture is made, a beam of uh, a jet goes out of their middle in the release of the energy. But what I'm going to be talking about is in our own solar system, uh, the coronal mass ejections. Here's the sun at the middle. Here is a coronal mass ejection, I'll tell you more about that soon, which are often associated with large solar flares, uh, and which are, again, the process where magnetic energy builds up and is released. Um, the, cent the core of the coronal mass ejection is the prominent seen in eruption down here. And another form of release in the, sun in the solar system is the Earth's magnetic field. The magnetosphere of the Earth builds up energy in its tail, which is dragged backwards by the solar wind. And this re the energy can be released when one of these CMEs hits the magnetosphere. And I'll show you examples of that soon. So this shows up all over the universe. In terms of being down to Earth, though, we're going to start the talk with talking about space weather and why we should care and what coronal magnetism in particular has to do with it. And then, can we measure the magnetic field in the sun's outer atmosphere? Or what can we do now? What is the state of the art? And I'll conclude by talking about plans that we are just now forming of how to come up with a, 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 a strategy for building together observations and models, as John mentioned, in order to quantify magnetism from sun to earth. So let's begin at the earth. We're in the outer atmosphere of, the, of a star, the sun. And that atmosphere is streaming past us in the form of the solar wind, which is magnetized plasma. And it is constant. But it's, it's continuous, rather, but it also can be gusty. So there can be gusts of strong magnetic fields, high density. Luckily, we're predicted, protected from the worst of this by the Earth's own magnetic field, which acts as a, a shield blocking the worst of the effects of these solar storms. Except that sometimes it doesn't. The shield breaks. And what happens is, if magnetic field coming from magnetized plasma coming from the sun is oriented so it's largely opposite in direction, from the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at its front, it reconnects, it breaks, and it wraps around and breaks again here, tapping into that energy that has been stored in the Earth's magnetic field in its tail. That energy is then transferred, and for instance, transferred along magnetic field lines, especially to the polar regions, 
creating the very nice effect of aurorae, but also, for example, setting up ground currents which can interfere with uh, power grids and cause blackouts and all sorts of problems. So the point I want to make with this movie is to show you that the direction of the magnetic field matters when it comes to whether or not something coming from the sun is going to cause a big disruption of our systems here on Earth. So what do I mean by disruption? I'll give you a quick overview of the kind of uh, space weather that we may see. Just like in a hurricane, you can have wind and you can have rain, different manifestations of that huge energy system. In space weather, when there's a storm at the sun, there's different manifestations. You can have light. That's what gets here quickest, of course, from x-ray to radio. The magnetized wind, which I was just talking about, that gust coming past, that can take something like one to three days before it interacts with our Earth's magnetic field. And then particle radiation. There's acceleration of particles that move to near relativistic speeds and come not long after the light in the order of tens of minutes or hours. And these all affect the Earth in different ways and the Earth's space environment in different ways. The light can affect, we can have radio blackouts, satellite drag, problems of navigation. The geomagnetic storms, again, they can couple with the power grids. They can cause ionospheric disturbances, navigation. And the radiation storms are particularly worrisome. We're protected here on Earth for most of this uh, from the Earth's magnetic field, but also from the Earth's atmosphere. But an astronaut going to Mars, for example, is, is at risk from radiation. Um, and again, communication, GPS, etc. So 150, 200 years ago, space weather was just pretty lights in the sky, and it really had no adverse reaction. But now it matters. Um, and just like with weather, you have to think in terms of the ordinary and the extraordinary. The ordinary, that's really nothing but like ordinary. This is, this is a movie taken out the window of the, the shuttle, actually. But these sorts of storms that give you aurorae um, occur all the time. Um, a storm at the sun can happen when it, you're at the height of solar activity uh, every day, more, more than once a day, uh, to maybe every couple of days when activity is lower. Not all of them are aiming at the Earth, but it's pretty common to get auroral activity at the Earth. What's less common is a superstorm uh, when, so for example, maybe on a 100-year time scale, there was one measured in 1859, I believe, called the Carrington Storm. This was such a big solar flare that Carrington was actually looking at a projection of the sun. He was drawing sunspots, probably, and he saw a flash of light on the projection of the sun. It's called a white light flare, and that is not common to have something that bright. And sure enough, not long after that, there's geomagnetic activity, which they were able to measure at this time. And the first real technological impact, uh, telegraph operators noted that there were sparks and there were fires lit of papers in the telegraph offices. So at that point, it became a reality here on Earth. So just as in terrestrial weather, we have to understand and prepare for both the kind of inconveniences we routinely face and extreme hazards that we will eventually face. So the good news, absolutely the good news, is that we know something is coming. Um, just like Harrington saw that bright flash, we, you, generally speaking, if there's a big CME flare, we will see it on the sun, and we will have warning. And for these uh, power grid couplings, that sort of things, we'll have warnings of a day to three days, which is great, really. I mean, um, this is a particularly nice uh, example of warning. This was when we had the stereo spacecraft in a, in a great vantage point, so we had views on the sun, not just uh, from the Earth's point of view. And we were able to watch the storm coming from the Earth and moving all the way out. It's been unwrapped. Here's the bad news. Generally speaking, we don't know the magnetic orientation of this storm. So we're getting better and better at being able to predict arrival time and trajectory and so on and so forth. If we have stereotype spacecraft, we really can do this. But how do we know what's inside it, what direction the magnetic fields are? Because what can happen is you can see a nice big CME at the sun, and then it's a dud when it comes to the Earth if the orientation of the field is not in a form that's likely to cause a big uh, geoeffective result. So we need to know the magnetic field. For that, we have to go back to the sun and to the origins, which are these coronal mass ejections and flares. And together, they're representing a release of magnetic energy. I mean, you can think of it as the, the, the flare is a release of thermal energy and, and, and radiation, and the CME is a release of kinetic energy. But the energy that's being released is magnetic energy that has built up. This picture shows a CME seen in a coronagraph view leaving the sun. So this is the mass, the plasma. This shows what's at the heart of the CME, which is the, the prominence, and it erupts. The speckled light are actually the energetic particles that are arriving not long after the light itself. 
hitting the spacecraft, which is um, observing it, like there, uh, coming up. And here we have a picture of the flare. So here comes the energetic particles. Now, I talked about at lunch coronal cavities. They're one of my favorite examples of stored magnetic energy um, because we see them persisting for days and days and days. And we have a model that tells us that we think they have energy stored, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then they erupt as the CME. And the model that we think explains the cavities is a magnetic flux rope. A magnetic flux rope is it's basically a concept for a magnetic field that winds around some sort of axis. Um, it represents, when you have twisted fields, they are more energetic. But if you just have tangled fields, uh, it's usually not a minimum energy configuration. And the sun will try to reach a minimum energy configuration. It will try to reduce the energy to the point it can without losing that twist. And that state is essentially a coherent magnetic flux rope. And a flux rope does a good job of modeling what we see in terms of the shape of the cavity, which is like a tunnel, really, in terms of the structure that we see inside it, its data and model, in terms of flows. And oh, this has been saturated just a little bit too much here. But what it is is a bullseye type configuration in the flows along the line of sight that we observe in the corona in one of these cavities. And as I'll show you shortly, the magnetic field will follow excuse me, the flows will have to follow the direction of the magnetic field. So if you think of like a set of nested slinky type structures, that is the magnetic flux rope and that's what the flows are tracing out. And I'll talk more about the polarimetry of the magnetic fields later in the talk. But for now, I'll also mention something I mentioned earlier today, which is that the shape of the cavity tells us something about whether it's likely to erupt which is that if we see a cavity that's so small and squat, it doesn't tend to erupt. When it has an elliptical shape, it's likely to erupt, or it's quite possible. But when it has a teardrop shape, it is, in fact, going to erupt to the point where I will bet on it and have, indeed, won bets on this subject in the past from people <laughs> in this audience, in fact. Um, so this morphology, we believe, is a result of the magnetic flux rope, that a flux rope is stable. It's a stable equilibrium state. But then as it continues to get energy pumped into it, because there's flows coming from below and twisting motions and magnetic twisted flux emerging through the surface of the sun, as that feeds this structure, it starts to rise slowly and reconnect beneath it and eventually reaches a point of no return and it has to erupt. So the flux rope model has been a powerful model for our understanding of the cavities and why they erupt. And another observation that they have been used to explain are so-called soft X-ray sigmoids. This was an observation from some time ago where the sun and X-ray has these active regions. These are, all, these are basically sunspots that you see in white light will show up in X-ray as these bright regions. They're very hot, very strong magnetic field. And some of them have a sort of an S or a backwards S-like shape. And what this work did was to show that the ones that had the S shape were more likely to erupt in the next day or so and that they transition from this S shape to something which is like a simple curved loop. And this can be explained in terms of flux ropes because the flux rope has a boundary, a magnetic boundary, which is sigmoidal in nature. And it's a place where you expect to have reconnections and heatings occur. Moreover, after an eruption, the magnetic field closes down and leaves the sun in a configuration which is more simple, le less energy. There has been energy release in this process. So all that is to say that we have a pretty good idea of what may well be the magnetic structure of these precursor structures, the things that are coming out to the Earth. So all we have to do is to start from a magnetic flux rope, match it to our observations before the eruption. We have simulations that can drive that eruption. And then we can show it impacting the Earth. And so we're done, right? We should be able to figure out what that magnetic structure is. The trouble is it's more complicated by that because the context matters around the source, both in time and space. And I'll explain what I mean. First of all, even in the simulations, here's a simulation, here's an observation, we notice something. Sometimes when these things erupt, they rotate. Now, you can imagine if your whole point is to try to understand the direction when you come to the Earth, you really want to have a handle on how much rotation happens during the eruption. Um, the picture, what I have here is a, a model with the mass that we think is erupting is the brown dots. And on the left, if you watch it a few times, I think you'll see that structure in the middle is likewise ro rotating. So you have to take that into consideration. 
Moreover, when we look at this particular model, the magnetic field is rotating and reconnecting. The fields are, are, that are snapping and reforming and connecting with each other. The thing that used to be a flux rope here is reconnecting with what used to be field that was just strapping it down. And the thing that actually gets out and escapes to the Earth is this huge, complicated structure, which bears very little resemblance to the original flux rope. In fact, it's gone through a topological transition in this case, and it's actually a Ceramac with the double winding number. So knowing the source before the eruption is not going to be enough. For that matter, you can have a problem with time. In the, here's that X-ray sigmoid, and it erupts. There's a cusp, there's a cusp, a cusp. So there's three eruptions here. And what's happening is, Oops, I don't want to just give that away. The flux rope is actually breaking, so only part of it is erupting, and some is left behind, and more twist gets added up, and it goes again. So the same active region is firing off over and over and over again, and that's what these observations show. And what this does for the model, in terms of the, the simulations we can see, is that when that happens, they catch up with each other, and they do what's called, they become cannibal CMEs, because one CME bumps into the last one. And this can have a big effect on space weather because the first CME can act like a snowplow, something I'm sure you all are very familiar with right now, <laughs> and pave the way so the next one moves along even faster. And there can be a, a particle acceleration that happens in a, in a, because of a seed population that's there and then gets accelerated. So these can be particularly devastating. In fact, people think that the Carrington flare was one of these, where you have more than one eruption catching up with each other. So again, you, you can't just take a single source and just kind of extrapolate it out to the Earth. That doesn't work. And then we come up with all these names. These are sympathetic CMEs, which is very, very nice. Um, basically, the idea is that you can't think of the source in isolation. You can't just drive a model which ignores the rest of the sun. Um, this is a lovely simulation, which shows when you had four flux ropes all lined up, this guy goes, drives eruption of this one, and then this one. So if you just considered this one in isolation, you wouldn't know the full story. And this movie, which I had shown, is showing something similar in terms of the eruptions of parallel structures. All right, that's the first part of my talk, which is to convince you that we need to know the coronal magnetic fields if we are going to be able to get better at understanding what's going to happen at the Earth. So how do we do that? Can we measure them? Well, we can measure some things for sure. And probably the most mature measurements are measurements of the surface magnetic field, the sun's surface, because it's, an, it's, it's where the, the sun, uh, the light is now, uh, goes from optically thick to optically thin. You have a very bright, visible uh, sun. You can measure the, the Zeeman effect, okay? So that, if you remember, that's when you have a splitting in a line under the presence of a magnetic field. And you can measure the magnetic field, which is shown here, the black and white, the different poles in and out. And you can do a very simple model called a potential field model, which basically says, what if my magnetic field is the gradient of a scalar like this? And then it says, well, we know there are no magnetic monopoles, so div B is zero, and those together give you Laplace's equation, which can be solved for in terms of spherical harmonics. And that's what's done in this nice movie, which is showing you the three-dimensional global magnetic field consistent with solving Laplace's equation with that boundary condition, which is very, very well observed indeed. The trouble with this, and it, it is that, I mean, well, the good thing about it is that it's very simple. You just need to specify the field at the, the lower boundary in an upper boundary condition where it's usually expected to go out radially into a solar wind. It does a remarkable job of, to first order, telling you roughly what the structure of the sun looks like. So when you have these closed field lines, which are like little loops, you tend to have bright structures. We have open field lines where the field goes right out. You tend to have dark structures, coronal holes. The trouble is, this right here means this right here. Curl of B has to be zero if this is true, and therefore there are no currents in the system. And I've talked about the importance of the building up and the storing of magnetic energy. And that energy is basically stored in the form of these currents. So this is missing the piece that we're really interested in in terms of being able to understand what's going to erupt. So what else can you do? Well, the next simplest thing you can do we know something about the corona. We know that the magnetic field is strong compared to the, the thermal pressure. So plasma beta is the ratio of these two pressures. So it's low beta. This is uh, basically one of your basic uh, momentum equation. And if you have low beta, this happens. You have a much simpler problem. And if you do this, 
set it to zero, you can solve for equilibrium where all you're doing is looking for a balance of those magnetic forces. What this leads you to quickly is this equation, which is that the curl of B is this. This is basically telling you that currents are parallel to the field. So this allows you to have currents, but they have to be along the magnetic field. But we think this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, estimation of what's going on in the corona because it's low beta. Uh, what, another way of looking at this is that you have a balance of the forces. This can be rewritten as two terms, a magnetic pressure force and a magnetic tension force. And so it's in its own self-equilibrium. It's just some references. So that's a very useful thing to do. So what do we know about force-free equilibrium? Well, one way we can get there is we can solve the full magnetohydrodynamic equation. So this is solving the equations that solve for the way the magnetic field and the plasma balance each other. And what you get is you have a dynamical relaxation to what is essentially a force-free equilibrium of the plasma and field. It's using this boundary condition, and you're making assumptions about the thermodynamics, which do affect the solution. What's really cool about it is it gives you the plasma, just not, not just the field. So this is now the white light observations that would go along with a model like this, which look a lot like what you see. But there's something you really have to bear in mind when you look, do a simulation like this, where you look at these results. They do allow currents, yes, and they found a nice equilibrium. But they're taking a single time boundary condition. Okay, So they're finding the force-free solution that is consistent with that single time snapshot boundary condition. But what happens in the sun is that there's a constant emergence of magnetic flux from below. And there's a constant twisting up of magnetic fields. And that information is lost from that line of sight boundary condition that's used here. So you've lost the information of the buildup of the energy, which again is sort of what we're trying to get at here. So here's another approach. This approach actually uses the full time history of the boundary. Uh, it, yeah, so it basically varies that boundary condition and it remembers from time, so what it's doing is it's doing, a, it's not doing the full dynamic solution because that would take too long. Because this is, as you'll see, this is a very, this uses a lot of time and the dynamic full MHD takes, it's, it's computationally too hard. So it essentially is solving for the quasi-static evolution of the field. It's not solving for the plasma imbalance. Um, and this particular case, it uses 100 days of observations and it slowly builds up the magnetic field. But what's interesting about this is it can build up these stored energy in regions like this, which are likely to drive an eruption. So this is an interesting approach, but it takes a long, slow buildup of this energy using all the information. So is there a shortcut? Can we use just today's observation to say what today's coronal magnetic field is? And yes, there's an approach where you take the boundary condition, not just the magnetic field, line of sight, the flux through the surface, but also the information of the vector field at the surface. And what that does is it allows you to have a boundary condition which is constraining both the coronal magnetic field and the currents. And so you have information about the currents that have been transported into the corona. And this is a very nice example of a recent simulation which is actually using the full global boundary condition to get a nonlinear force-free extrapolation from vector fields. However, the results are very sensitive to the measurement uncertainties, and the vector field measurements can only be done in these active regions. So you're really not getting information from the rest of the sun with regards to the vector fields. Uh, it depends on your simulation uh, size. And, and if there's a very strong current, so much so that the, it's no longer, you don't have information about it, it becomes detached, you can't capture that with this approach. And in various tests, there have been real inconsistencies between methods. So there's not really a consensus of how this can be used to give a nonlinear force-free, uh, to retrieve the magnetic field in the corona above active regions, although it is our best way of doing active region fields in general now. However, our best way using the photospheric magnetic field. So all this is using the boundary. We did all this without even looking in the corona. So what if we look in the corona? What if we look for observations in the corona themselves? Because when we look at the corona, this is what we see. This is a coronal loop. Now, when I'm talking about magnetic fields, we talk about magnetic field lines. And all that means is it's the direction of the magnetic force. And we draw a line that connects the direction of the magnetic force. It's a mathematically abstract concept. And yet, here it is. We're seeing it. We're seeing magnetic fields. We're seeing these loops. And the reason we're seeing them is because in the corona, 
It's very high conductivity, very low diffusivity, which means this term drops out, and we have what's called flux freezing. The magnetic field has to follow the, fluid, the, the plasma, and the plasma has to follow the magnetic field. And it actually comes back to that plasma beta as, as to which way round it is. So like inside the sun, the plasma beta is large, which means the, the, the thermal pressure dominates over the magnetic pressure. There, the field is sort of passively carried around with the flows inside the sun. In the corona, where it's low beta, the fluid follows the field. So the field is like a skeleton, and it lights up in these loops, or in this movie, you'll see there's stuff shot out, and it's following the skeleton. It has to follow those pathways. I, I like to think of it as like, you know, bright lights of headlights of cars on a highway, and the highway is the magnetic field, and the cars are the, are the fluid. So it's following, that's, how we're, we're, that's what we're seeing in the corona. So we have information of the coronal magnetic field in the corona. And so there's another approach, which is to take the nonlinear force-free type extrapolation, but to use information in the corona to constrain it, as well as the boundary condition. And this particular method was developed here. Um, uh, and it's called the flux rope insertion method, which takes the, looks at where there is a prominence or a filament on the disk of the sun and inserts a flux rope there. Because in, we know that there are currents there, and so it inserts it in the form of the flux rope with free parameters for the axial and poloidal field. These parameters are then chosen to match the observations. It uses essentially the same method, uh, the magnetofrictional method, so it's not an MHD solution, uh, it's a, but it is a solution, a nonlinear force-free solution, where the flux rope is confined by the surrounding fields. And it is currently in the state of being, it can be embedded into a global model, so you can do an active region type uh, structure like this, and it can be embedded into the full sun. And I'm going to come back to that right at the end of my talk. All right, but first, what about polarimetry? We talked about the Zeeman effect and how that allowed us to see the boundary of the magnetic field. Can't we observe that in, this, in the corona itself? And the answer is a qualified yes. Um, the Zeeman effect is, is measuring circular polarization. I'll refer to the Stokes vector of polarization, which is I, Q, U, and V, intensity of a line, the linear polarization, or the Q and the U, and I'll talk about L as being the square root of Q squared plus U squared, their magnitude, and V is the circular polarization. V is created by the Zeeman effect, and it's, it's very nice because it's a diagnostic of the field strength. In this case, the field strength along your line of sight. Now, one thing to bear in mind, the photosphere is optically thick, the corona is optically thin. So any measurement like this is, all, is weighted along the line of sight. It's an integral along the line of sight of what you're looking at. Um, the Zeeman effect favors long wavelengths, visible IR, because otherwise the splitting is, too, is, is basically can be bigger than the, the width of the line. I believe that's correct. And if you're looking in the visible IR, the sun, the surface of the sun is invisible and is so bright that it's going to blind you and that's the only thing you're going to see. So you have to use a chronograph. You have to block out the surface, which means you're getting information just here at the limb. We call the limb of the sun is the, the edge. Um, and it's a difficult measurement to make. It requires very high telescope sensitivity. This is a, a, a measurement that was made, but as far as I know, has not been reproduced about 10 years ago. Um, it's a, it's, it requires very high sensitivity to make this measurement. All right, so that's one way to get magnetic field strength in the corona itself using polarimetric measurements. Another way to do it is using radio gyro resonance. And what this does is actually, it's, it's very complementary to the other approach. Because what happens is you have electrons gyrating, creating an opacity that forms in a thin layer. And this layer is essentially giving you an iso-gauss surface because there's a linear scaling of magnetic field. In this case, the last one was line of sight field. This is magnitude of magnetic field with frequency. So for a given frequency, you're picking out a surface of a given magnetic field strength. It's, uh, it's a way of diagnosing magnetic fields in a very strong active region. Um, and one thing to bear in mind is you don't know the height of the surface. So you know this is an ISO surface, but you're looking at it in projection, and you don't know what height each piece of information gives you. But it is a diagnostic. The third diagnostic of strength is we see waves. And these are alphane-like waves, and you can come up with a, their velocity perturbations, actually. So we can observe these perturbations, and we can get phase speeds. And it is basically the idea is that they are now sensitive proportional, rather, to the plane of sky field strength. So all of these are giving you different pieces of information. You do need the density information as well. And you also have information because the waves tend to propagate along the magnetic fields. So these are, this is the state of the art at the moment in terms of di diagnosing magnetic field strength from measurements in 
the corona itself, coronal polarimetry. Um, the first two were, they're not done routinely. They're, they've been done kind of proof of concept. This observation is now in a synoptic telescope, which I'll go on and describe. It's called the coronal multi-channel polarimeter. And it is a, uh, it's basically 20 centimeters telescope, so it's quite small. It was meant, I mean, it's, it really is a prototype for this measurement. Um, and it's in Hawaii. It takes daily observations, and these observations are available, widely available. It can take the circular polarization, but with 20 centimeters, it simply doesn't have the light gathering capability to make that measurement. For that, you need a bigger telescope. I'll mention shortly a bigger telescope that's proposed, and there's another big telescope that's being built, which is the DKIST, which you may have heard of, formerly known as ATST, which is going to be a very large solar telescope, and which will be able to make measurements of the circular polarization. But what COMP can do right now is measure the linear polarization because it's 100 times brighter. It's daily observations, full sun. Um, this linear polarization, and what we plot here is actually the fraction of linearly polarized light, is telling you something about the direction of the magnetic field. It operates, in this case, as a depolarization. So where it is dark, you learn something. It's bright when the field is in your plane of the sky. It's dark if your field is directed right along your line of sight. And it's dark when the field direction in the, in the, in the corona goes through this magic angle of 54 degrees. And when it does that, it goes the linear polarization drops out to a null. And at first, this seems like a, a poser. How are we ever going to figure this out? But it actually turns out to be diagnostically a very useful thing. The direction of the linear polarization that you're measuring is essentially telling you the direction of the actual magnetic field in the plane of the sky integrated along the line of sight, subject to an ambiguity because it flips by 90 degrees when it goes through this 54 degree angle. So, yeah, I know that's a lot. And the only way that you're going to get a, some sort of sense of that is for me to give you a good example of how this actually could be useful. Because it sounds like, how are you possibly going to pull out information from something that complicated? First of all, the line of sight. A lot of people are, were worried that we're not going to get any information because it's, it's integrated along the line of sight. Well, everything you see in the corona is integrated along the line of sight. So there are structures that have structure that can be resolved. And one of the best is, my favorite, the cavity. Oh, yes, it's integrated along the line of sight. So I would not forget to tell you, full disclosure. And this is what a cavity looks like in this linear polarization measurement. And this is why. We think they are magnetic flux ropes. And if you have a magnetic flux rope at the axis, the axis by definition is pointing right at you, which means you'll get a linear polarization null. And when you go through 54 degrees in the flux rope, which happens along these surfaces, you'll get a dark inversion line. And when you go out above the flux rope to the simple arcade, you'll get a V shape. If there was no flux rope, you'd get a straight up V and nothing else. Now what happens when you integrate that along the line of sight? I've mentioned that these are tunnel-like structures, right? So in a tunnel-like structure, it reinforces and this is what you get. You get these lagomorphs, which are basically rabbit-shaped structures. That's what the name means. And this is what it looks like when you take a magnetic model and you synthesize what you would expect. And this is what you get from the observations. Um, the green arrows are showing you the direction, and these are the knolls. And you can see the knolls have largely been preserved and kind of smeared out in the rabbit's head here. And you can see the direction of the field is coming up like this, inverting, and now it's going up and so on. This is a very robust observation. We've observed cavities now. A cavities can be present three or four in a single day. And when we see a clear cavity, we see a lagomorph in the, in the comp observations. So this is a clear indicator of the magnetic structure. OK. This is great. But if we're ever going to predict BZ at the Earth, we're going to need more than these sort of um, confirmations of our models. It's good. It's definitely good. I like to see good evidence of a flux rope. We ultimately want the full global three-dimensional magnetic field at the sun in the corona at any given time so that we can run models from it and we can figure out what's, make probabilities, forecasts even, of what's going to happen next. So that brings us to COSMO, which is our proposed, I mentioned there were two telescopes. The DKIST is going to go to resolutions ne uh, that we've never seen before in the sun. And it's going to do fundamental science of the, those, those very, very, very high spatial resolution, temporal resolution. But it's a microscope. It's zooming in on one region, on the sun, to do, diagnost to do you know, diagnostic work. The concept of the COSMO is to do the whole sun all the time, because if you're going to build a global field, that's what you need. Um, 
Cosmo as a telescope, here's our, our nice artist conception of it, it consists of three telescopes. Two of them are actually, one of them's done, it's online. The other is prototyping. And the third one is the, uh, the large, it's basically comp, but one and a half meters instead of 20 centimeters. And that's what we're hoping to get funded so we can build it. But here I want to pause because it's all very well to have a really great telescope that takes the best observations ever. It's going to open a new observational regime. We know it is. I mean, even COMP. COMP amazed us with what we've managed to get from this, this little 20 centimeter telescope. So we know we will get discovery with COSMO. But if you want to quantify the global coronal field, you need a strategy of how you use these observations. You can collect all the photons in the world. But to get to the end goal of forecasting BZ, what do you do? So we need a strategy. And so the strategy that we're building up right now is to start with the observations. You cannot do anything without the observations. But we also need models, and we need global models to try to put it all together. It's very hard to see how you could do this analysis without having some concept of how the magnetic field in the full sun is connected. And we have really good models. This is a nice example of one of an eruption where the color coding tells you the direction of the magnetic field. So it's uh, blue for BZ negative. So this is giving you that example. And then we need more than that. To pull it all together, we need, we need data science. And we're starting to collaborate um, at NCAR with the, the computing lab there to try to come up with methods that pulls this all together and helps us figure out how we can use the observations and the models together. And this is our framework. And I'll give you a little bit more detail before I finish. First step in any, this is an inverse problem, right, that we're talking about going from the observations by way of the models to come up with what we want, the physical state, the magnetic field. This is an inverse problem. And you cannot do an inverse problem without a forward problem. And so we've built up a network of uh, software which can go from a physical state, density, temperature, magnetic field, and generate a wide range of observations. Many of the things I've shown you today, the white light observations, the polarimetry, the extreme ultraviolet, all of this. Um, and soft x-ray radio observations as well. And we use existing software in order to do the line modeling of the extreme ultraviolet and the ultraviolet observations. For example, people here work in these regimes. And we have a code to generate the linear polarization, the circular polarization, et cetera. What this lets us do, first of all, is to get a good, uh, is to basically very simply model how, for example, introducing a flux rope into something that was originally a potential field and there's the V, which is there just because it's 54, three to 53 degrees, becomes a lagomorph when you introduce a current. And the, higher, the more current you introduce, the higher the head of the, the rabbit gets. So we can, we can forward model these things. And so we're going to put it together in a scheme in which we start. This is a collaboration now between um, people at NCAR and with, here at CFA. It's to do a forward fitting of the global field, where we start with an initial guess something like this potential field, maybe something more complicated is our initial guess. We generate synthetic observations from the potential field or whatever our initial model is, and we'll f identify the regions where they fail. And we add currents to those regions. And we do this using this method that I described before of flux rope insertion. And then we solve for the best fit parameters based on these flux ropes. And we're going to basically use this as our starting way of trying to build a 3D global field. The collaboration with our, our CISL collaborators is to do this efficiently, because that's not, you know, as, as, as uh, solar scientists, I think, you know, that's not the first thing we think about when we're designing our codes, <laughs> and it's very important. And for one thing, I've been told, and I do actually understand and agree now, that the code that I've written is embarrassingly parallel, in that I'm taking the same calculation many times, and I could do supercomputers very quickly. Um, and the idea is to do statistical methods. We're going to solve an ensemble of maximum likelihood solutions. And this is important. We're going to look at the different sensitivities of the problem to different kinds of observations. And in fact, we will get uncertainties from our statistical distri distribution that can help us design and choose measurement strategies. We have all of these observations. And I think I've shown you the, the importance of the polarimetry. Um, both now and the ones we hope to get in the future. The importance also of the coronal observations and the emission and so on. How do we use all of them? We have a lot of information. And the boundary. We can't forget the boundary. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop test beds. And using these forward codes, we're going to create, we're going to start from some energized coronal field configuration and set, design a set of uh, fake observations that we can use to test our models. 
both the ones we have now, or we know we're going to get eventually, and observations, this would require a, a, a space mission because it's in the Lyman Alpha in the ultraviolet. But this is another kind of polarization. And the thing is that these different observations give you different sensitivities. Some of them, the radio observations, can tell you about the field on the disk of the sun. The infrared can tell you about the field on the limb of the sun. The ultraviolet gives you a different sensitivity to the plane of the sky orientation than you have from the infrared. Um, you have different sensitivities, even the same kind of physical process, if you're looking at one visible versus infrared, they're sensitive to different temperature plasma. So you can probe different parts of the plasma along the line of sight. And you have different relationships with the magnetic field vector. So I, it's very hard to see how you could pull this all together without some sort of essentially forward-fitting path. Um, it enables a kitchen sink approach. Here's, these are all sorts of things I talked about today, different observations that you can make and we can synthesize. Um, if we can synthesize it, then we could use it in our fit. And it allows you, one of the biggest issues is how do you take care of the line of sight problem? Well, you can try to take the solar rotation and do something like tomography, but the sun evolves. So when you've, the sun is rotated, it's different. This way, we can probe different parts along the line of sight and use them in combination. And now, finally, this is the, the key point. By using these synthetic test beds now, before we have these big telescopes built, we're going to try to determine what is the actual optimum set of observations to constrain the problem. Do we need a fleet of 100 spaceship ringing the sun? If we do, we're in trouble because we're not going to get that. <laughs> but what, how much would we helped if we had one that was, for example, uh, in an orbit where it was seeing the part of, the, it was seeing as at the limb observation, the stuff that it's, is on the disk that's facing right towards the Earth. This is the stuff that's coming out in, an, in a coronal eruption. How much would that help us? So we're going to try to, to determine that. And to conclude, um, first of all, I hope I've uh, convinced you that magnet coronal magnetism is important for space weather, and that we have a range of observations that give us clues to the coronal field. We actually have a, a remarkable range of observations that are, that are somehow diagnosing it. The polarimetric are particularly important because they're telling you the most direct information. They're sensitive to the field itself. But actually quantifying the 3D global field from these data is not easy. So, oh, I don't know if I told you our name. <laughs> it's the Data Optimized Coronal Field Model, DOC-FM. And it's an MHD model-based approach to forward-fitting the global field. We're going to develop synthetic test beds in order to allow us and others, we're going to make these available so other people can try their methods, because we're kind of trying to build an inversion framework here, right? And those three parts of the framework, the observations, the models, and the optimization methods, we have our ideas of how to proceed. But there could be other models, other observations, and other optimization methods that could be slotted in. And we want to be open to expanding in that direction. Because our ultimate goal is to be able to, to warn you if there's a big southward BZ storm coming so you can um, realize that you, you won't be able to do Facebook for a day and, and go camping or something instead. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and there's been, you know, I'll mention this number, although please don't quote me as saying this number, but there's been numbers of like $2 trillion being the potential impact of a, a superstorm in today's day. You need to bear in mind that would be if we did nothing. And the problem, the most expensive, the most dangerous thing is the power grids. And if there was a catastrophic failure of all the transformers in the country and we had to replace them all, and I think that's where that, that number came from. Um, the thing there is, the power grid op companies, they don't want this to happen. <laughs> and I was talking to somebody at NOAA just last week, and he was saying, you know, they are actually very conservative. When they know something's coming, they know that there are false positives, and you may tell them there's a storm coming, and it may be a dud, and they don't care. They're going to ramp down their, their power, their efficiency, and to such an extent that they're not going to catastrophically fail. So I don't think you have to worry about the apocalypse coming from one of these superstorms. Having said that, there could be serious damage, and the more we know, the better, because it is expensive. Airplanes, for example, it's, they're not going to fall out of the sky. Please don't say that I said that. <laughs> but they do have serious communications issue um, from these storms. Uh, so for them, 
uh, if they knew for sure, they might change their flight path. But it's tremendously expensive to try and change their flight path. And right now, if you give them a false positive, they, so they don't want to do that until they're sure you're going to give them consistent data. So yes, there are things to be done. And the things that are really, really serious, people are going to do even in the current state, and we're not going to have a total devastating effect. But we can do so much better. Um, for the person on the street, it's not going, you're not going to have any physical injury. An astronaut in space, you do have to worry about it. It's really the technology, the satellites, the communications, and the uh, power grids, that kind of thing. So this is probably a very ignorant question. You've got these beautiful models of these flux ropes, and most of them are anchored in the sun. And everything's OK under the photosphere. Right. Are you obeying the laws of physics? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good. It's a very good question because it's very easy to get stuck in your regime and say, "Oh yes, I'm, that's all under the sun, and I don't need to worry about it." Um, yes, we are obeying the laws of physics, and more than that, uh, the models, the next generation models, are very much models that cross that boundary, and so they're modeling the, the transport of magnetic flux inside the sun and through the surface of the sun and into the corona. So that's definitely where the modeling is going. Um, in the meantime, we have a boundary condition and we use it, and how it gets that way, we don't worry too much about, but it is done in a way which is physically sensible. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. But there is, I, I do think that is what needs to be done, is that kind of the, the, the emergence and the full model from inside to out. There are different regimes, though. You can imagine, I talked about the plasma beta, the physically very different regimes, and so getting something that works in all regimes simultaneously is a challenge. So it seems like the flux ropes do have a very clear observational signature. And I learned a new word today, ligomorph. That's a great one. Thank you. <laughs> like, what's the context? How much of the problem is knowing where the flux ropes are actually solving? Like, are they a huge part of determining the structure of the magnetic field? Do they really place a strong constraint? Or is it just kind of a cool thing, but it's not that coupled? Fair enough, I would say, and I'll be loose in my definition of a flux rope. I'll talk about a concentration of current along a neutral line. There's some uh, debate about whether uh, if they twist around more than a full turn, and if they don't, they're sheared, they're not twisted. But don't worry about that. The accumulation and the twist of shear along a neutral line is fundamental to the sun's corona, because that's, what's the, that's where these prominences are, and coronal mass ejections are utterly dependent on the location of these prominences. So they are fundamental to space weather and CMEs. Uh, yeah, uh, making a model like this is totally essential for the astronauts because there's so little delay time you have to model the actual thing on the sun. For the uh, hitting us, you could, for uh, space weather and knocking out the power grid, uh, it's not, you could just have a ring of satellites that was internal and just measured the direction and the amplitude of the uh, thing. So, in a way, you don't really need this. It's, it's a good point because actually the most useful information is from a satellite. It's not, it's not ringing. It's just one. In the, it, 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 it's sort of just upstream of the Earth. And that is the, the final proof test of what's coming. And there's about 20 minutes warning from that? Yes. OK, so that is the, the real truth. But it would be nice to have more than 20 minutes. Uh, yes, you could have. Well, there's all sorts of schemes for doing that. Yeah. But what I, what I didn't know that was how your modeling is going to deal with that twisting, which you said in was the, so in the, in the In the on the ejection. Right. So <clears throat> this is the first step. <laughs> it's a pig fish step. But if we have <laughs> the full global chromal magnetic field, what I envision is that we could run uh, an ensemble of models again where you're perturbing it, you're emerging flux, you're twisting it up, you're poking it, and you're seeing where it erupts. And then you build up an, a probability of eruption from different regions and the nature of that eruption. Once it erupts, and, and so as you get more data, you narrow in on that. And once it erupts, it's a, it's a kind of data assimilation. You have, again, an ensemble of all the possible uh, how it interacts with the fields, et cetera, and you use the observations to narrow in on that. And I think you have to also have observations, not just in the corona, but all the way in the heliosphere. There are Faraday rotation observations, heliosphere images like I showed you before. You continue to constrain the problem as it goes, and then hopefully you'll have all the information you need about what arises here. But it's, a, it's an end-to-end -end problem, ultimately, and a big one. How much do these uh, eruptive events contribute to the steady state heating of the corona? So probably not so much to the, it's a really good question, I don't actually know. Um, <laughs> but I, my gut, the thing I jumped into, is probably not so much. There's magnetic energy constantly coming into the corona, and it's being dissipated in the form of heating. 
whether that's happening through little tiny flares live all over the place or through waves that are heating or some combination is, is a matter of debate. Um, there's also the solar wind is being acceleration, accelerated, and so there's, there's, there's energy transport. And then there's the energy that builds up in these prominences, in these flux ropes, and it goes and it erupts. And you have a fast release of thermal energy, but I don't have the sense that it's a huge contribution to the heating of the corona. Kathy's shaking her head and she would know. The CMEs themselves are about 10% of the mass flux in the solar wind, because there's a background solar wind all the time. So uh, my understanding is that the photospheric magnetic field and structure on scale is a lot smaller than anything that we can resolve right now. I, I guess GPS will probably help with that. Um, seeing as that's one of the battery conditions of all these models, is that does the uncertainty of what's going on at those small scales affect things a lot, or is that kind of average? Out? It's an interesting point because what happens is you have a sort of a cascade from small scale to large scale of the magnetics. Uh, uh, so what you have is you have twist, and you can have tangled up twist, um, and that's not very. It's a highly energetic state you can minimize your energy by going to larger scale. And so the presence of these flux spurts has been argued to be the, a result of an inverted cascade to a Taylor state of magnetic configuration. So then, what's happening in the small scale, scale doesn't really matter to the large scale dynamics here. It's just part of the process that's feeding. So it's very important for other things, probably for coral heating, for example. But from the point of view of, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, um, Yes, that's another thing which I, I like, like the solar interior I, I'm putting under the rug a little bit. But I think that's because there's a fundamental thing happening here, which is that the spatial scale of these structures is the result of an energy minimization process. Um, if I could ask one quick question. Uh, in the forward model, uh, you're using Chianti, you're predicting the AIA brightness in these EDD bands. You must have some kind of uh, prescription for the heating as a function of magnetic field or something like that. Are you thinking of this as a way to better understand the heating, or is it really a way to find out more about the field? It's absolutely to be used in exactly that way. What now, forward is agnostic about the models in a sense, because the way it works is you give it a magnetic physical, a physical state density temperature using whatever model you want. And it can be a model where you figure out your density and temperature from, from some sort of scaling law or whatever. But that has to be the input to forward, which then takes that state and creates the observable. So forward doesn't do the actual calculations of the physical state. It uses them as input. It comes with some canned analytic models and some tie-ins to existing resources that are on you know, software that exists. But you can bring your own cube of whatever model you want to do and test it that way. All right, are there any more questions? All right, let's thank Sarah again.